from a persecuted science. I will return to my forest to die in peace. The whole of science and all its appendages are just a bunch of thieves, hanging like puppets on strings and having to dance to whatever tune their well-hidden slave masters deem necessary. Victor Schauberger, in the last letter before his death. Victor Schauberger began his career as a forester in Austria, an outdoorsman, one would say today. He spent hours watching the lively streams of his homeland, watching the trout stand or jump through the waterfalls. Something, he realized, was wrong with the physics he had been taught. The eddies he saw in the streams not only sought the path of least resistance, no, they unleashed their own forces, and the gills of the trout were like engines with which the fish sucked themselves through the water without effort. Entropy the tendency of things to perish in disorder, he recognized, was a law of technology, of inanimate nature, or nature controlled by man. Animate nature, on the other hand, was capable of creating order from within itself, and in doing so, did not dissipate energy, but concentrated it. This is how the idea of developing a technology close to nature was born. Victor Schauberger left his beloved forests. He took advantage of the ability of water to accelerate itself in the form of a vortex and developed the home power plant, a small electricity plant for domestic use in which water whirled downward through ram's horn shaped pipes and, through the resulting thrust, drove a generator that produced far more electricity than was necessary to bring the water back up again. The trout gill transformed into the repulsion, a flying disc that sucked its way up through the air like the trout in the waterfall. These technologies put him in a tricky position. On the one hand, the military was very interested in using his inventions. On the other hand, it was clear that these inventions could never be used in the civilian sector. A functioning home power plant would have made people independent of oil and coal, and the large flows of materials from which so much money could be made would have dried up. What Schauberger left behind was a mass of partly cryptic writings, often in the form of letters to friends, in which he reveals a fascinating view of nature. One of these text fragments tells a lot about our relationship to the soil and shows some solutions beyond conventional agriculture, which can also transform deserts into fertile land. Some of the nomenclature is still from 19th century biochemistry or borrowed from alchemy. For a better understanding, some of the terms are translated in square brackets. Victor Schauberger, Vienna Hadersdorf, 1706-1942 Dig a hole in your garden about 1.5 meters deep, which has as narrow a cross-section as possible at the top and widens toward the bottom similar to the well-known Turkish coffee pots. It would be best if the hole was lined with a type of natural rock that is lacking in the area. So in the limestone mountains primary rock and in the primary rock area limestones, it can also be a sunken wooden barrel, but not girded by iron hoops. In this barrel or well hole are added copper, zinc, and solidified blood substances such as resin or small horn chips, if possible, i.e., a regular element similar to a bell battery is produced, termed a galvanic reaction. The hole should be chosen in such a way that the midday sun can incorporate as much fertilizing material waste as possible, termed photosynthesis. During daytime, the water surface becomes warm, and thus the fertilizing substance, oxygen, becomes active, the fruit substance, carbon and hydrocarbons become passive due to heat influence. If the sun sets and the influence of coolness occurs, then the case is reversed. For example, the fruit substances, carbon and hydrocarbons, become highly active. The fertilizing substances, or oxygen, however, become inactive. If one gives the eternal feminine the cold shoulder, it becomes fiery. Thus, a similar fermentation process comes about as in the fermenting cellar in which the wine becomes all the more fiery, as more favorable temperature differences take effect, which create tension differences, 
which are the cause of every authoritative movement. If the surface of the water is covered with dark green algae, the water can be used, but this layer of algae should not be destroyed because it is a natural filter created by the solidification of the high-energy iosis. In fact, it is possible to avoid spraying the plants because the excess rays pass horizontally through the surrounding soil, cross with diffuse solar wastes, and thus produce groundwater, the natural accumulator that provides the water and soil sustaining power. If you want to obtain particularly good garden fruits, take rainwater that comes into a wooden tub in which the water is first well sunned and then, towards evening, add it to good clay in small quantities, which is known to contain aluminum. This mixture is well stirred with a wooden spoon, while the water should cool down towards 4 degrees Celsius as a result of evening chill. In this case, indifferent energy values are atomically bound. The water becomes specifically heavy and dense. Next morning, take a so-called palm brush and sprinkle the surface of the garden, like the priest does with the holy frond. When the sun comes, an indifferent membrane solidifies on the surface of the earth through reactive regression. The hymen of the earth mother, which allows only the most valuable things to leave and the most valuable things to enter. Through this gossamer filter, an extraordinary tension is created between the negatively charged earth and the positively charged atmosphere. For example, between the accumulator of fruit and the accumulator of fertilizing substances, the geospheric surpluses of which solidify in the light and in the heat, whereby an extraordinarily good growth appears. Growth is nothing else than solidified fruit substance energy. So one has to provide for the buildup of fruit substance energies so that the sun, when it passes over the field day after day, has something to fertilize. Hence the aforementioned element in which the bipolar metals play the role of exciters, which form the living intermediate band of which Goethe, for example, speaks, and without which no propagation and planting forces can take place in a water that is poor in metals. The horn shavings are an already higher synthesis formation of animal kind, which belong to the three-body system metal, mineral as vegetable life. The resulting carbon-oxygen synthesis product, which is one octave higher, is an amphorous structure, which partly solidifies due to the influence of the sun, and thus results in the visible growth phenomenon, which naturally becomes more and more valuable the more basic values are balanced. In the garden trees, shrubs and also weeds should not be missing, because it depends on the strongest possible mixture, see the mixed forest, that strong tension differences become effective. In a well-mixed garden that has its field of tension in order, the same miracles of growth happen as in the natural permanent forest, which can be restrained in its unbridled growth only by the firepower. The humus, therefore, plays only accumulative roles, because if one provides for the internal soil force buildup, then the fruits grow on humus-free soil exactly the same as on humus-rich soil. Soil yield is therefore a question of whether the internal movement process works. Everything else is then a biological consequence of a well-functioning restructuring. A woman can be very lean and very fertile, and the same is true for the primordial Mother Earth. Who mistreats this must then muster all kinds of brain power in order to be able to cook from the little that is left what can still emerge at all in the fertile Earth, thanks to senseless interventions in the natural development process. We have to thank this purely intellectual action of those who have no feeling for today's nutritional misery. In any case, one must also have the courage to hear the other side. Because every human being has the right to live. The artificial fertilizer blessings have yielded the sad fruits that we have today. They act as a whip, discharging the groundwater, which of course has to sink when fire-discharged pollutants rob it of the fertile substance, the eternal feminine, which keeps the earth-heavy water in delicate equilibrium. Somewhat less cryptic was the work of Nikola Tesla, the second great genius who worked in the period between the world wars. Tesla was fortunate to be able to build his physics on the unadulterated foundations of electrodynamics. Maxwell had started from a rather abstract theory 
and had postulated three solutions from pure mathematics for the electromagnetic oscillations. The longitudinal wave, the transverse wave, and the scalar wave. Known electromagnetic waves like that of light corresponded mostly to the transverse wave and were well detectable by measuring techniques. With longitudinal and scalar waves, physics had a difficult time at that stage. They were simply not measurable and were therefore sidelined. The young Tesla was the first who succeeded in a metrological proof of longitudinal waves with a mirror galvanometer between copper plate and earth. This, however, at a time when physics already got along well without this waveform. The properties that Schauberger had already recognized in nature, in particular the ability to bundle and concentrate energy, became explainable and reproducible with longitudinal and scalar waves. After the first successful experiments in the laboratory, Tesla worked on the wireless transmission of energy, an undertaking that drove him to ruin mainly because of the gigantic privately financed experimental facilities. He had already made concessions. Originally, he wanted to have the energy donated by the Earth to decouple it from the Earth's own fields. Out of consideration for his former clients from the economic sector, however, he refrained from this and was content with the technical transmission on frequencies on which the Earth itself had nothing to contribute. Nevertheless, the establishment knew that this box was not to be opened. Similar to Schauberger, Tesla died impoverished and frustrated in his home country, Croatia. Closer to practical solutions, although further away from any established nomenclature, was Wilhelm Reich. Reich, too, was a natural scientist in the classical sense of the term, and he was active in the 1950s and 1960s. He was interested in man, and in particular in his sexuality. Starting from this field of research, he recognized those physical fields in nature that are responsible for fertility, as well as for the sexual attraction between the male and the female, where Schauberger communicated in his own private secret language. Tesla had used the correct but outmoded terms of school physics. Reich created his own nomenclature and made a claim to absoluteness for it. The life energy responsible for fertility in nature was called organ. He developed a series of devices, mostly passive in nature, to focus and concentrate this energy. The most famous are the organ accumulator, a chamber that was supposed to bring vitality and healing to the occupant, and the cloud buster, a kind of cannon without ammunition with which one could dissolve or amplify clouds as desired. I do not mention these three naturalists because they are the only ones who had important contributions to make, but they described independently of each other, in three different nomenclatures and fields of work, the ability of nature to bundle energies in self-organization and concentrate them in one place to create order instead of consuming it, and developed technical applications that did things that clearly contradicted the learned opinion that nature knows only one direction, toward chaos. If we connect their teachings, the correct connection to the established nomenclature of Tesla gives us the possibility to also correctly understand the immeasurable possibilities of Schauberger and Reich.